you are listening to Single Service. My name is Arno Marchere, and I am your host. Single Service is a podcast dealing with design, architecture, business, and city building in which I interview an expert on a specific subject matter. Together, we dive into that topic and challenge conventional thinking in a thought-provoking conversation. I sincerely hope that you will find these conversations as engaging as I did and learn a thing or two in the process. Don't forget to send us your comments, criticism, and praise. To do so, you can email us at hello at rvltr.studio or leave a comment online. You can also subscribe to the podcast on our website at rvltr.studio. Today, I'm welcoming David Peterson, a Canadian Toronto-based architect and educator who's made it his mission to develop and design housing that is conducive to the flourishing of its inhabitants. Unlike many talking heads, David puts his money where his mouth is and has developed multiple housing projects that are desirable and desired at both small and medium scales. One of my favorite multifamily buildings in Toronto, the Ritchie, was designed by David. We will discuss socially fit housing, drawing from David's experience with working on such projects. So thank you very much, David, for being on the show. It's truly looking forward to this conversation. Arno, thank you. It's been a, it's a pleasure. I'm glad to talk with you. So can you... Tell us who you are and what you do in your own words in three sentences or less. As you said, I'm an architect and educator. Um, I see those two disciplines as really related. I, um, for me, one informs the other. And the practice has primarily focused on housing, although we've done uh, and are doing many other kinds of uh, building types. But for housing for us really is this complex program that has a chance to speak to both our social uh, values, but also uh, complex programs and teaches us a lot about other kinds of buildings that we engage in. So you gave a talk uh, a while back at IDS Toronto on socially fit housing. Can you tell us what it is exactly? Yeah, the term socially fit housing actually comes first from core housing needs, which is this term that the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation, CMHC, uses to think about uh, housing. Um, and it has these kind of three aspects, affordability, which we've been taught we can talk about, um, and also adequate in housing, adequate housing essentially is maintenance. And then they speak about socially fit. Uh, for CMHC, Socially fit really means um, that demographically there is enough bedrooms to uh, for children in a particular kind of description that they use. But I've come to think of socially fit housing related to a demographic group and then their their needs related to um, sociability and kind of um, and and the kind of um, relationship to both form and um, and that's uh, availability to kind of social spaces, essentially. So can you tell us why that's important to you? I think it's um, really important because we speak about all the time about uh, sustainability. And we know that sustainability, we often speak about it in terms of like energy and the environment. Um, but certainly sustainability also has an aspect of affordability. Um, and so certainly it's something that's exceptionally energy um, or environmentally sustainable, but it's unaffordable that we don't have a situation that's going to be tenable. And the same is true if we said that that same thing that we're calling sustainable isn't including social sustainability, then we have a problem. So for instance, a good example, it might be that you're thinking about um, a housing unit that could be very small um, and it's in its small size speaks to environmental sustainability and affordability, but it may not be socially fit. Um, mm -hmm. If we're asking increasingly um, families to live in smaller and smaller spaces that are increasingly isolated as well. Yeah, and I think it's a very important point you make because I've heard in recent times more and more people speaking to the fact that while sustainability is important and, um, you know, we should be mindful of how much stuff we produce, how much energy we consume, energy in all its forms is also extremely important for human flourishing. So um, I can see a parallel between what you're saying and the fact that uh, environmental sustainability should probably shouldn't come at the expense of human flourishing and, and human progress. Otherwise, we're kind of losing all the benefits of 
uh, what we've seen since, say, since the Industrial Revolution and how much the world has improved overall. Mm -hmm. It's not to say it's perfect everywhere, but how much it has improved overall. Um, so I think you've touched a bit on that, but why do you think we should advocate more of uh, that socially fit housing that you've described? I think it in part, large part because there are forms that for housing or other kinds of um, uh, building programs, we might say, aren't necessarily any more expensive. Uh, but if we change that form, we may find we find that we actually gain something socially. Um, so it's it doesn't come with an additional cost. Really, what it's requiring from us is a shift in our minds mm -hmm. uh, to say that not this building form, but that building form, not this arrangement of units, but that arrangement of units. And we can talk more about that. But essentially, it's it's that as a beginning point. It's almost like at that early stage of conceptualizing the problem um, that we need to shift what we do. And so can you speak a little more um to specific examples of work you've worked you've done because i personally know some of your work or most of your work and i can see that mm -hmm. in it but can you give us some examples of how that's that's been um uh, a part of your kind of design ethos and how that has made projects better yeah i think for me it begins by um, thinking about it in a, in a site plan almost. You know, like when we think about, um, and our, as architects, we kind of get taught this, the public space and the private space. But what seems to get left off is semi-public space. Mm -hmm. It's that space in between, it's actually that social space. If you think about public is the space of the sidewalk where um, strangers might meet. And then the private space is that realm inside the space. And then for low-rise housing, the porch is that kind of semi-public space, that kind of intermediate space between uh, these yeah. other these realms. But that's in multi-residential housing, that's entirely removed. Mm -hmm. So what we try to do in our buildings, like made a courtyard building that you mentioned at Ritchie, the courtyard is that semi-public space. It's that space that's not entirely public because it's not, it's not open to the street, but it's shared. So all the units that face onto it have access to it, and then it becomes this kind of intermediate space that people can gather. And because their private spaces are adjacent to it, they're aware of the activities inside that semi-public space, uh, which activates it, which encourages you to kind of go in and out. It's all those sorts of things that create um, an ease of inside, outside, that architects love to talk about, um, but we see less and less uh, because we've continued to remove some public space from much of our design work. Mm -hmm. And and even I had that conversation with another architect recently, there's there's not even that many public spaces in, in this city anyway. Mm -hmm. um, he was talking about what's happening at Dufferin Mall and the idea that there's this giant parking lot that's completely mm -hmm. underutilized. And he suggested, I thought that was a crazy but interesting idea that this could be turned into a public plaza. Um, so I digress a bit, but uh, not only we like public spaces, but I don't think we have a lot of semi-public spaces. And speaking to that one specifically at the Ritchie, what's always been interesting to me is that it's behind a glass door. So when you walk by, or, or maybe it's a, a, a grate, some kind of, but semi-transparent, mm -hmm. you can see through from the street. And that space has always been very appealing to me. I've been lucky enough to go in at least a couple of times just to check it out. But even to, for two passerbys, it's, it's a very intriguing space because you can't get in, but you can see what's happening. And I, I find that fascinating. Um, so we've talked a lot on this podcast about the lack of housing. And I think uh, that's a drum that's been beaten to death, although the problem is still there. So maybe we can talk about that a bit more. But what do you think other challenges uh, the city is facing when it comes to housing specifically? I think it's, um, you know, the challenge has everything to do with uh, both regulatory challenges, but then challenges that we face from the market and our prescribed almost uh, we come into we go into housing thinking there's really these two choices towers and then low-rise buildings that are private mm -hmm. um, and that you know there's much talk about the kind of missing middle but really we could still make mid-rise buildings and have them be mini towers still not include any more semi public space still not include that kind of um, uh, transitional between public and private so that our, even our mid-rise buildings could still face challenges to try to accommodate families. Mm 
um, really part of the research that we've been thinking about in practice and in, in um, as an educator is to think about those with limited mobility. So we speak about children, but um, it's also true for seniors. Um, where you've got limited mobility and the architecture is really starting to dictate then um, your connections to others. Uh, because if you can't just pick up and go and meet someone in that public space elsewhere away from your place, from where you live, then you're really relying on the architecture to make it easy for you. Mm-hmm. Or And if it doesn't, then your socialization suffers. And there's been an abundance of research that uh, demonstrates this. During the pandemic, we saw things kind of get worse. And there was this uh, researcher uh, from Maximum City that looked at children and asked, where do they play? And and it was pretty clear that if you lived, if you were a child and you lived in a low rise setting, you had more places to play. You know, front yards, uh, if you lived in a cul-de-sac. And those were easy places to get to that were safe, where parents could kind of see you playing. But if you lived in a tower, then it you know was more difficult to get to some of those spaces. Mm-hmm. And there were just fewer of them. And, and was, as a consequence, we saw well-being suffering in those children that were living in high rises. And, and so um, I, I keep going back to the Ritchie, but I think it's such a, a fascinating example. Because w- w- you've done it, you've built that building. What kind of challenges did you experience? And, um, and also I'd like you to speak a little bit Um, to the residents' response to the building and because it's been around for a few years now and I'm sure you've kind of kept in somewhat in touch at Mm -hmm. least with how the building is doing. Um, So so let's break it down in two questions. One, the first one is how challenging was it for you uh, overall to to get this built? And then the second question is how has it been doing since now that It's been around for a while. Well, the first challenge was around the idea of courtyard buildings because in North America, we don't really have too many of them, especially Mm -hmm. in Toronto. So the idea of a courtyard building is that you're going to push the building's envelope to the perimeter. So it means zero setbacks so that you can maximize the space in the interior part of the lot. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that was a a challenge. Um, Maybe a little bit easier at the Ritchie site because uh, three sides of the property were industrial. Mm-hmm. So they, there was less resistance to first accept that we would have zero setbacks on those sides. Um, and, and that made it a little bit easier. And then it was also the idea that um, I wanted people to circulate through the courtyard mm-hmm. because it was that uh, incidental social contact that I was looking for. So it meant that I was asking people to not move through the building in um, hallways that were Uh, entirely interior. Uh, it was really forcing people to kind of move from the street through an open space like a courtyard mm-hmm. uh, and then into their unit. It has no interior circulation, if I recall correctly, right? That's right. right. Yeah. All so, the circulation is in semi-public spaces. So all the units are double loaded? Yes. The, so the units have are through units. You get light from at least two sides. Mm-hmm. So that meant that, you know, the possibility of cross-ventilation was improved. You have uh, multiple sun exposures, but then you also have the, the increased possibility of also seeing neighbors. So the circulation path was, um, you know, really seen as a place to pause at times. Like it was intended that there were these kind of view corridors from the corridor into the surrounding neighborhood. Mm-hmm. And then the courtyard was this place that was, you know, apart from the city where it was uh, well treed. We continued the trees from from uh, the residential backyards into our area. So they, we saw it as a kind of continuous space, mm-hmm. um, both for people and as a kind of bird habitat. And then wa- adding water to that space also just uh, created a place away from the street that would be a place that people wanted to kind of gather. And I think that's what we've seen um, over the years. Um, I've heard from families that have raised their children there And, um, and it, you know, it really seems like it worked as we had intended, which was to say that um, parents gathered and children gathered and fell into a lot of independence by moving in and out of their units into the courtyard. Um, I had it photographed again in the last few years. And while we were there photographing things, um, it was functioning in the same way. Children playing, mm-hmm. one parent for multiple households while children kind of did their own thing. Um, so it was, yeah, it, it was a success in that regard. And so if 
by any measure, the building has been a success. Why do you think this hasn't been replicated by you or other people? As Because now there's a precedent in the city of something like that working. Why don't we see more of that, do you think? I think it's just because the market is so accustomed to a building type, which is to say it's their towers. And uh, on sites like that, we would have, you know, we might have tried to make something increasingly larger. Um, you know, since looking at Ritchie and doing that, I started to look at more and more places where we have uh, quasi courtyard buildings. And in practice, uh, we just completed a laneway house and mm -hmm. there was a main building and then a laneway house. And then the space between is functionally a courtyard. Um, and I think it's four units in that um, project, but it, it still creates a condition where you can imagine that that semi-public space of the court of the back, what was a backyard, functions very much like Richie's courtyard. So there's all those kind of small scale proposals, and I've come across other townhome complexes that arrange their townhomes around a landscape, mm -hmm. um, not uh, architectural marvels in any regard, but. But socially, they're functioning in the same way. Yeah, so. I've seen some of those too. And, and those spaces are always very interesting because the ones I'm thinking about, uh, the cars are kept on the outside and That's then right. the courtyard in the middle is strictly pedestrian, maybe for bikes too. And it, it seems to be a, a very pleasant space to be in, even if the buildings themselves are not that exciting. That's right. I mean, so it begins really with a, a kind of site organization that suggests first we're going to start with this um, shared space without having to eliminate private patios that everybody wants and should have. Mm -hmm. So it seems like housing for family with children is, is one of your, um, uh, one of your things it's, it's important to you. And Toronto continues to add housing in the form of towers. How are these accommodating households with children? Well, the city of Toronto, I think acknowledges that there is a need to kind of um, move what everybody understands as a kind of social isolating tower and try to accommodate families in them. Because um, moving forward, in, well, in some neighborhoods already, we have most of the households with children live in towers. And increasingly, that's going to be the norm throughout the city of Toronto. Mm -hmm. So the city of Toronto has a document called uh, Growing Up Vertical, where they're studying families in high rises. Um, but unfortunately, the document doesn't make a shift uh, in the design of the tower. Really, their principal way of accommodating families is to have public spaces that are family-oriented or children-oriented adjacent to the building so that you could leave your unit and then find a, a park relatively close. Uh, the trouble with that, though, is that you still have a situation where that kind of independence that a child has of going inside and outside that, that that you have with Richie or other kinds of types we've talked about um, is not there. So it's possible that a child living on the fourth floor and there's a child on the third floor and they'll never encounter each other. Mm -hmm. That kind of incidental contact because their units are isolated, um, no sense of what's going on in the, cor in the corridor um, to create any kind of connection. And, you know, and this has been going on for such a long time that parents have found their own kind of retrofits for these things. Mm -hmm. um, in my interviews with parents, they were doing things like leaving the door, their apartment door ajar, mm -hmm. um, so that they could, if not see, but they could hear their kids playing in the, cor in the corridor. Mm -hmm. um, um, during my talk at uh, the Interior Design Show, I was told by um, a man that was in the, in the room about what they did in their stacked townhomes during COVID. They, again, no semi public space. The closest that they came to that was the parking garage mm -hmm. that all the stacked townhomes were sat on top of. And they used that as their place for the kids to play. Um, they all moved the cars out of the parking garage. And because of that reasonable adjacent space to where they were living, the kids could easily gather there and they played soccer and hockey inside the parking garage. Um, so that tells you that, you know, parents recognize this need for this yeah. and are finding any way to retrofit their existing conditions to make it work. Mm -hmm. And a friend of mine who's also an architect and urban planner was telling me that she wants to live in a condo because she's into that kind of urban living. But she had the hardest time finding a three plus unit That's condo. Right. The, the biggest ones typically are two bedrooms. Mm -hmm. uh, most of them are studios and, and one bedroom plus den, perhaps. Um, why isn't that? I, I'm guessing that's primarily because it's the, the performa for the developers push them to p put more of those units out. But if people are willing to buy larger units, why aren't they put, putting more out? 
I think the, you know, I think that's shifting. The city of Toronto too has, as a part of that growing up vertical document, has um, been pushing developers to making two bedrooms and three bedrooms. And the reason in the past that it was, we were less likely to see it, it had to do with the parking count. For the same unit, you would mm. require a higher, higher parking ratio. Mm-hmm. And uh, now that's gone. So now that's gone. Yeah. So that's one problem kind of off the table. And with the city pushing for it, we have seen more two and three bedrooms in new developments. But I would say, though, that the idea of um, accommodating families is one of, of space, adequate number of space inside the unit. But really, it is that those units are isolated. And we put a lot of pressure on parents to overcome screen time or other kinds of things uh, when the architecture is making it difficult for you to connect. Mm -hmm. Um, Simple things could be done like, you know, putting transom inside of um, uh, corridors so that you could at least have some visual connection to what was happening in that space. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, if you saw another child there, like the front porch of of a house, you have some visual connection. Uh, and that might that starts to move us a little bit closer to turning the corridor into something more than just a, an exit path. It, it just brought the idea to mind. Could corridors become social spaces? Like, because would that work from a, a code and safety perspective, or is that something that's always going to be frowned upon? Well, it's you know, the, I think there was a time where um, typical housing was very different than, say, housing for say seniors. But we increasingly, as the building code continues to shift, we come closer and closer all the time. Mm -hmm. Now residential buildings are sprinklered, and that has been the case for Mm -hmm. some time. When we have um, um, AODA standards that want the corridors to be wider, then we're also talking about increasing the width of a corridor as well. Mm -hmm. So we we were taking baby steps towards moving us towards what looks like more and more like a nursing home. This kind of group B classification for a nursing home that has use inside the corridor is something that we could start to really think about for for our residential units. And in some ways, like I compare these populations of people, uh, the low mobility senior uh, or the child that, that also has limited mobility because of their age and cognitive ability. They have a lot in common. So it makes sense that in some cases when we make these multi-residential buildings, that we start to take on parts of it that look more like seniors housing. It could be seniors housing, it could be family housing and start to create floors where we do more of that. Yeah, and it would be interesting to see, although in in the Canadian context, I'm having a hard time imagining it happening, but it'd be interesting to see corridors being designed as like programmed spaces where it's not just a place you go through to go from the elevator to your home, but it Mm -hmm. becomes a play space, a social space. Maybe it's a bit more expensive, so you have more room for those things to happen and still, you know, you can put your strollers in a corner and they don't, yeah. you don't trip on them when you go to the, the elevator. That would be very interesting. Yeah, and then you could start to do other things where you'd say, rather than collecting all the amenity space in one spot, distribute it across floors. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, parents find it difficult to find enough townhomes to buy inside the city. Well, you could essentially create floors that were more like townhomes mm-hmm. where they have some connection to the outside Uh, larger corridors that could have occupancy on them. And and yes, they would cost a bit more, but not more than your detached or semi-detached house uh, that's in a low-rise neighborhood. Yeah, yeah, So you would start to create more options of units inside our uh, large multi-residential buildings. So Toronto is going to... It's planned, uh, slated to welcome hundreds of thousands of new immigrants in the next couple of decades. I forget what the exact numbers are, but quite big. How do you think we accommodate um, those people that are going to move in terms in, uh, into the city in terms of housing, but also uh, why do you think it, it should be incumbent on us and important to advocate for them? Because they're not here. No one is here to advocate for them, but eventually they'll be here and they'll be contributing mem- members of society. Um, what's your take on that? Yeah, I, I think, you know, you know, some people would say that uh, we have to make towers in the same form that we do because uh, we just need more housing units and, and we have to add housing this way. Um, but all you have to do is look around the world to see that there's lots of places that are adding housing units that are green and are, uh, and are facing similar challenges, but are finding ways to have more varied versions of their multi-residential buildings. I really think that the next generation of multi-residential building 
we'll have more green spaces. We see that showing up in places like Singapore, where their green standards for their multi-residential buildings are extensive. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea of kind of biophilic housing um, is what they're doing most often. Uh, so often that in the public sector is kind of leading the way for private sector development because there's this kind of um, uh, lessons learned that the public sector is, as they make more and more public housing, uh, is teaching the private sector for how to be efficient, find, uh, discover new um, kind of uh, models for making housing. And I think that's what we need. It's, it's really a variety of building types that we can, that are, some already exist here, but you know, we don't have to look very far to find um, a whole new generation of, of tower. And Singapore is an interesting example. I'm not super familiar with their architecture, but I do know that they have a number of high-rise buildings that have public spaces at different levels mm -hmm. throughout the building. And they have uh, play spaces, ele elevated gardens, courtyards that people can use. And so there's precedent out there. And, and Canadian climate might be a bit more of a challenge. Yeah. But you could also realistically assume that you build a greenhouse type of space that can be enclosed in the winter and open in the summer. And then I think we, you know, it's part of our uh, mindset that we've thought of the winter as um, such a challenge mm -hmm. that we, we, we want to hibernate almost. Yeah. But really, landscapes in the wintertime are possible, out, you know, next to our buildings, on top of roofs. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are still landscapes that we recreate in, in the wintertime in Canada. Yeah. Um, and those landscapes can be in part... Um, on our buildings. And when we have them around, uh, it's just really deciding that we'll do more of it and mm -hmm. that they become, even in wintertime, social spaces that, that have a connection to our interior spaces. Um, there is, you know, in my growing up, I grew up in Toronto, so I, there was a building that Arthur Erickson had done that was right off of the garden, and I can't remember the name of the building, but it had um, a series of jack pines that were, that were uh, in a landscape that faced the gardener. Mm -hmm. And as a teenager, I always looked at that and I thought, wow, look at that. Look at how these four or five story uh, pines were growing comfortably there. Mm -hmm. uh, and it made me think that this was possible, that this is a, something that, was, um, that we just had to decide to do. It's possible. It's probably a bit more challenging in this climate, but it's, it's certainly possible. I've, I've seen precedents for that. Um, So how do you, how do you, would you get the private market to make changes that will lead to more uh, socially fit housing as for all demographics? I think it, it um, they need the private market needs to have more demonstration projects, uh, and and that's to say that you know something that can kind of say look here's a model for making uh, changes uh, to the tower you've done. Uh, and and see how well it works. So they just we just need to do more demonstration projects. And because city programs like Housing Now and um, are involved in making new multi-residential developments, uh, I think it's incumbent on those agencies to start to say uh, we're not just going to take market solutions for building forms. Uh, we're going to look at how we can do this because um, I do this constantly in my projects. You know, the challenge of how do you make a landscape that's above the ground is not nearly as challenging uh, as we might think, mm -hmm. um, technically or from an, even an expense point of view. Uh, and, and we see it because it's happening throughout the world. We're just so convinced that the norm is, only, is, is what's possible here. And that's why I say I think the more demonstration projects is what the marketplace needs. And, and then that will kind of move the, the kind of bar towards, okay, there it is. It's happening not once, twice, three times, four times um, in our climate. And, and then that starts to, you know, create a precedent for how the market can start to behave. And, and I think the more that we see that too, the public will start to say, okay, I see that happening in these other places. That's what I want. And if I can have that, then I'll choose that over um, what is our current norm. So unlike you, I didn't grow up in Canada and I have still to this day, even after 17 years, incredible challenge with how conservative the Canadians can be in general. And I'm broadly generalizing. But what I've noticed also is that politicians are incredibly timid and, and reluctant even to maybe promote or, or facilitate those kinds of demonstration projects that you've spoken of. 
how do we change that? How do you convince people that it's actually a good thing and that there's really no risk in it because the precedents exist even in this city. There's not that many, but they exist. Um, and and it, it, it's extremely likely to make things work for the better. So why there, is there still that much uh, hesitancy and, and how do you think we overcome that? You know, um, part of my education was in Holland and I had gone to Holland specifically because they were um, making exceptional housing. Mm-hmm. And what I came away from thinking after being in Holland was that um, it wasn't that their architects were better or more creative than us. It was that they had more f- a variety of financial models. Uh, the way construction is, is uh, designed and financed to go hand in hand here and that there was so few financial models, like the idea of co-housing as a way of making housing. Uh, we have so few examples here. Mm-hmm. Where in Denmark, there's just an abundance of them. Uh, Co-housing, the model where uh, multiple people share a home, and then you have a, a you have private quarters and like common kitchens and things like that. Is that what you're talking yeah, about? Yeah. Well, apart from even the form, the you you start with a kind of financing financial model for mm-hmm. it, which fundamentally says you own a part of a corporation rather than a part of a building. Yeah. And that already means that you are coming together to make a form of co-owned building yeah that and whatever it's forms inside because i think here we get put off by it because we think the idea of sharing too much maybe is uh is off-putting that's also very common in france where yes. when you buy say you buy uh let's talk about paris because it's what everybody knows you buy an apartment and building in paris you buy with it a portion of the commons right they they divide it in thousands so you buy two hundred thousands of the building and that makes you a co-owner and then you have a say in what, how the building is managed right. and financed. and, and uh, So you're renting, but you're also an owner in some ways, right? That's for when you own. If you're a renter, you, the, the landlord will be the owner of, a part, part owner of that, of all the comments that belong to the building. But that also exists in um, suburban developments where you have single family homes. The property the homes are on, not the homes themselves, but the commons, like the roads and whatever public amenities there are, are also managed that way. So mm-hmm. it's not, it's a model that works and it's, and it seems to be very effective. So I've always been surprised to, to know that that basically doesn't exist here. Yeah. And it's, you know, and I think part of it, when we look at um, the financial models that were used to make Regent Park, the redevelopment, or other kinds of projects that are going on that Housing Now is involved with, I think that there is an opportunity there for the public to continue to be involved in ownership and and find new forms. Um, and I think that's, I think, there, so that's why I, I come back to the public has to um, decide that we're going to increase the amount of public ownership of housing, which is incredibly small in Canada compared to France. Your example for France, 35% of the housing in France is in that public public realm. Like uh, public housing? Like, yeah, I want to say uh, public housing here has such connotations, yeah. but it's like it's, it's publicly owned. Like in Singapore, it's more like 80%, but it still has a market relationship as well. So when so, you say publicly owned, what do you mean exactly? It has, it may be, um, it may be like uh, a leasehold kind of arrangement mm-hmm. where it was, you know, built on public lands, but it's a private leasehold onto that public land. So it's mm-hmm. actually a 99 year lease yeah, yeah. on those lands. So it, it has this kind of strange mix of both maybe being constructed by the private sector, but long-term ownership in the public sector so that you get uh, a bit of both happening. But those sorts of mixes still here are very few compared to like, I think France is 35 and Holland's around the same. Yeah. Singapore is outpacing all of them at more like 80%. So if change starts with the financing models or the, or the, the ownership models, why do you think we don't see more alternatives here? Is it that people are resistant to it or are there like regulatory barriers to, to new models? I'm not sure exactly. I think it's, you know, our financing regime is very rigid. I think it's, you know, when you speak about conservatism, I think it's, that's where it starts. Mm-hmm. It's really there first. Because if you let 
architects, like I, I get a little frustrated when I see uh, architects from elsewhere coming to Toronto to design buildings. And I think the architects here are capable of, of uh, all the kind of inventiveness that we see else from elsewhere. It's just that um, when they are asked to do things in this context, we are, you know, we're constrained by financial models that assume a, a form um, because they go hand in hand. Yeah. And the idea of kind of inventing a, um, a form that is not proven financially is what causes the kind of uh, no-go situation. Uh, and I think that's, again, coming back to um, public housing, that's the real opportunity where they could spend a bit more time in schematic design and work through forms and test them against the financial models to come up with things that can be demonstration projects. Yeah, and if the city has land that's available, then they could just make it available for new models and say, we're well, let's experiment. Let's yeah, I mean, if you thought about it too, like you'd say part of the next generation of housing is going to have um, environmental sustainability to contend with. Mm -hmm. And I'm suggesting that we also need to contend with social sustainability. Mm -hmm. And so those already, those challenges suggest new forms. Yeah, uh, I would put social sustainability ahead of environmental yes. sustainability because if the social fabric breaks apart, like environmental <laughs> sustainability is pointless. Yes, so it, they were both necessitate new models. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense that we're not going to get that from the private industry. They're not going to all of a sudden invent ways of doing either of these things better. So we, we really need the, the, pri the public sector to kind of step up, demonstrate that, and then the private sector is more likely to follow suit once we've got increasingly more examples for them to look at. So how does one, how would one get involved in, in the process or the, the kind of the discussion or the public discourse to start changing things? Because it, there comes a point where talking about those things is fine and, and I'm glad we're doing that, but I think if things are going to change, like what, how do you see that happening? What, what would you suggest if say one of your students came to you and say, I want to make a difference. I want to try new things. What would you tell them to start? I think this is where uh, my life as an educator is important because if we give students problems that say, take those housing now sites. And I think the last time I looked, there were 21 sites, give those sites to students um, and have conversations with the profession. So there's this kind of dialogue between educators and students and the profession and really work through uh, new models and, and, you know, and move that discourse away from aesthetic appearance mm -hmm. towards, uh, you know, understanding things socially and environmentally. Uh, I make this point that, you know, when we look at our towers, that now we're making these towers that stagger and twist but they're exactly the same social models. Uh, double loaded corridors mm -hmm. um, where the corridors are unconnected uh, socially, where they're not connected socially, and a single elevator that gathers hundreds of units. So it makes it really difficult to know, uh, to know your neighbors. Uh, and, and, then allows, and if you have amenity space, then you're also gathering the whole building in that spot. So again, you, know, you don't get this kind of smaller grain of social connections. And it doesn't matter that the building is twisty or 1970s boring and flat, right? Uh, yeah, it makes no difference. I lived in one of those buildings a dozen years ago, and it had pretty decent amenities for a basic condo, but those amenities were only open in the summer, namely a pool and a deck. Right. And so in the summer, it was very social, although overcrowded. But very social because people would meet on the pool deck and hang out, have barbecues, whatever. But in the, summer, in the winter, it was dead because everything was closed. Mm -hmm. And so basically eight months out of the year, you had no social space to speak of. You had the, the usual party room, whatever. But these are not social space because they're just rented by a group of people mm -hmm. to get together. But it doesn't allow residents to connect with each other. So maybe the gym, but the gym was completely underutilized. Every time I went, I was like the only one there. So Yeah, I mean, gyms are really like, uh, I think they could get rid of gyms inside of buildings and decide to do uh, something different there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So... I think 
that's kind of the all the questions I had for you. Do you have any last words or any any last thoughts you want to share with the audience? Yeah, I think that you know we were speaking about how to make a shift, uh, and I think educating the public. But I think too that you know for a long time, and it's still the case that architectural education and interior design education, like design education, um, architecture in particular, has been associated with engineering for good reason. Mm -hmm. um, there's a strong connection there that uh, we will continue to have. But I think you can, easily, you can equally make the argument that architecture should be connected to social sciences and life sciences. Mm -hmm. And that an architecture school that's also highly tied to the social sciences makes a lot of sense. That in fact, architecture with public health is what I'm advocating for, which is the mm -hmm. idea that you would have sociologists in your crit, not an engineer necessarily, right? Or someone from the building science faculty or that yeah. you're- Or psychologists psychology. or- yes. So like, you yeah. know, in architecture school, you go through and you, you have building science courses and engineering courses that are compulsory. You have a litany of engineering courses, mechanical, electrical, um, structural, But there are no courses that, ma there, there are no mandates for a social science course or a psychology course or environmental psychology course uh, or biology that might help you understand that, yes, it's possible to grow some of these plants, mm -hmm. trees in these environments. Or if there are, there are electives and they're not part of the curriculum. Exactly. Yeah. But yeah. I think it's, my point is that it, it's, it's a, it should be a fundamental part of an architectural education and that schools of architecture need to be tied to you know, uh, public health. Yeah. And, and, and I remember from my architecture education that there wasn't really any conversation around how will the building affect people's well-being when they do good or bad, no matter what you do, the building will affect its inhabitants. So That's it's, right. it's critical to know at least on a surface level that what can be done to go one way or another. Mm. It's, it's interesting. Um, well, I want to thank you very much for your time. It was a very interesting conversation and hopefully we can have more in the future. Yeah, great, Arnold. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, Arno here. I hope you've enjoyed this episode and that you'll come back for more. Please share with your friends and colleagues and remember to subscribe on our website at rvltr.studio. Until next time, ciao.